Hello, everybody. Hi, uh, this is Jim Murphy, professor in the Graduate School of Geography. Welcome to the second sessions of this afternoon. Before we have a fine meal after a break with some cocktails. Um, I am really honored and privileged to be able to chair this, this particular session, which is all about, uh, as it says, Clark Graduate School of Geography's contribution to public policy, institutions, and the discipline of geography. And we have a really wonderful panel of four grads of the PhD program, and one and two faculty in the current um, uh, program. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce brief bios of each of the panelists, and uh, then they're going to proceed with their, their, their remarks. Uh, and we're going in the order you see here. We'll start with Tony, and then Riku, and Jackie, and then Andrew. Uh, so let me start with Tony Bevington. Uh, Tony Bevington is International Director of the Natural Resources and Climate Change Program at the Ford Foundation, having previously served at Clark University as Director of the Graduate School of Geography, and the Milton P. and Alice C. Higgins Professor of Environment Society from where he is currently on leave of absence. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been a Guggenheim, Guggenheim Foundation Fellow, uh, an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow, an Economic and Social Research Council professor, Professorial Fellow, among others. Bevington held earlier positions at the Universities of Manchester, Cambridge, and Colorado, as well as the World Bank, Overseas Development Institute, and the International Institute for Environment and Development. His work is focused on extractive industries, natural resource governance, territorial-based development, and civil society organizations. Uh, we had to add extra lines in the program to get all of Tony's titles right, and we still neglected to put in the program that he was director of the Graduate School of Geography for seven years. Whew. Rinko Roy Chowdhury is a professor of geography at Clark University. Her work focuses on the institutional, ecological, and spatial diversity of human environment interactions in agrarian, post-agrarian, and urban ecosystems, including themes of smallholder decision-making, political economy, land stewardship and restoration, and climate resilience. She is currently on sabbatical at Harvard Forest, where she, explore, where she is exploring the resilience of forest commons in central Massachusetts, Integrating Collective Action Theory with Approaches in Land System Science, Regional Political Ecology, and Environmental History. She has led key working groups in the U.S. LTER Network, co-chaired the Scientific Steering Committee of the Global Land Program, and served as past chair of the American Association of Geographers Human Dimensions of Global Change Specialty Group. She was a coordinating lead author of the inaugural IPBES Global Biodiversity Assessment launched at the UN in 2019. Jacqueline Bajunek is a 2007 grad of the PhD program in, in, in um, Graduate School of Geography. Um, she is currently a professor in the Geography Department at Oklahoma State University. Her research contributions lie at the nexus of the human dimensions of global environmental change, governance theory, and cultural and political ecology. She also regularly teaches and writes about mixed and participatory research methods in transdisciplinary research. Her primary research centers on the adaptation and resilience of small agriculturalists and NTFP, non-timber forest product, uh, extractivist households in the Americas, and has been funded by NSF, USDA, and Fulbright. Jacqueline served as an NSF program officer from 2018 to 2020 for the Geography and Spatial Sciences slash Human Environment and Geographical Sciences program, as well as a variety of other cross-directorate programs. She currently serves as a faculty fellow for strategic research initiatives for the College of Arts and Sciences at Oklahoma State University. Last but hardly least, uh, Andrew Schiller. Uh, he is the founder of Location, Inc., a location-based data company serving the fintech, insurtech, and real estate markets, and the inventor of NeighborhoodScout.com, which now has served over 200 million users. The Location Inc. was acquired by CoreLogic in 2020. Andrew graduated from the GSG with a PhD in 2001. Previously, he was a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab and director of science for the Nature Conservancy's Tennessee chapter. 
So I, it's a pleasure to welcome our four panelists, and we're going to start with Tony and then proceed down the line as you see. Thank you all. Okay, um, thanks, Jim. Um, and first of all, thank you to everyone and all the work that's gone into making this happen. It takes a bucket load of efforts. Um, and particular thanks to, to Jim and Brenda for the support, at least to me, in getting to this panel. I assume I was asked to speak on this panel because I tend to get thought of, I think, as the person who a person who engages with policy and institutions um, beyond the discipline, which may be so, but I think it's also true that any number of people here in this, these two days have similar engagements, and anybody else could be up here making similar comments. And I say that not with any false humility, but just to say that we've all lived a GSG inflected life in different ways, and those different ways take us to different views of how this community has engaged with uh, discipline and beyond the discipline. So what will follow are just my views. Um, and they are views, it's not, just, it's not an attempt to document, it's, it's, it's an argument. And I want to organize the argument around six main claims, which I'll say first, because I'll run out of time. And, and they're these. The first claim is that GSG faculty and alumni, alumni alike have long made important contributions to policy debates and design, and have long engaged with institutions beyond the academy. That's a deep history. The second claim is that those contributions to policy and institutions, which is my primary focus here, have often been because of disciplinary contributions. Or put another way, intellectual innovation and leadership often exist in synergy with contributions beyond the academy. There's no contradiction between excellence and relevance. The third claim is that these contributions have been made in quite varied ways and that it's simply not helpful to suggest that one way is better than any other way. Fourth claim, fourth point, um, is to say that at least since the 1960s, there's been a diversification in views regarding which publics and what public questions should be prioritized in these engagements. And by the same token, there have been important differences in viewpoint regarding which institutions to engage with. There's perhaps been a shift away from emphasis shift of emphasis away from focusing on government, mostly federal policy, towards engaging with the policies of a wide range of non-governmental, civil society, and what one might call, using Alice Mulder's term, privately public institutions. The fifth observation is that one real yawning gap in faculty engagement, so less so for alumni, has been the relationship with the private commercial sector. And for that reason, it's really great that Andrew's here to speak to that, because that's what he has lived. And sixth, and finally, last claim, is that I'm not, in making these claims, I don't want to argue that there is anything particularly distinctive about the GSG in comparison to other departments of geography around the country. It doesn't really matter what we've done better or worse than other departments. What matters is to tell our own stories well and to own them. So those are the half dozen claims I want to make. And with the rest of my minutes, I just want to offer a few bits and bobs that try to give some substance or background to those claims. So while engagement with policy doubtless precedes the Second World War, that's where I want to begin. As a way of suggesting that GSG faculty have a long history of engaging policy. In that period, Samuel van Valkenburg was advising the US government on the war effort as also which geographers in other leading departments across the country. Of course, policy advice was not all, nor even most of what he did. He was a leader in the early development of political geography. He taught, he wrote textbooks, and so forth. He later became director of the department as well. But engaging with policy institutions, and specifically those of the US government, was part of that package. And perhaps another observation about that engagement is that it was one in which he sought to provide an input to help make policy better. So in that approach, policy relevance came from usefulness and from problem solving. That approach to relevance and engagement was changing by the 60s, amid the civil rights, the anti-war, and the student movements. In some sense, for those of you who remember this article, who had to suffer it in some history and theory of geography course, 
In some ways, von Valkenburg's engagement with policy was grounded in Patterson's four traditions of geography, and particularly, perhaps, those traditions that Patterson called the spatial tradition and the area studies tradition. But by the 60s and 70s, what Jim Blout later called the dissenting tradition had also become stronger Clark and elsewhere, of course. And that dissenting tradition, which was related to GSG's leadership in radical geography, was not one that, I want to suggest at least, not one that necessarily shunned policy and institutions serving different publics, but it was, and it is one, that asks difficult questions of policy and institutions, and that prompts students also to ask difficult questions of policy and institutions. Indeed, there's a memorial essay that I came across preparing for this um, in a 20, 2005 issue of Antipode. It's honoring Jim Blout after his passing. It's written by four former Clark students who had worked with him. Tom Cock, Kirsten Johnson, Deva Kaznitz, and Ben Wisner. And in their different contributions to that essay, which is worth a read, each speaks to how Blount's teaching and mentoring that derived from that tradition of dissent had encouraged them to move into the workspaces that they ultimately chose. For Johnson and Cock, those spaces were within institutions that implemented or commented on policy, while for Kaznitz and Wisner, those spaces were in some sense at the interface of the academy and public action. So I think it's not the case that the critical tradition of Clark has been one that has consigned itself to distance from policy, institutions, or action. It just charted a path to particular sorts of institutions and particular sorts of publics. Now, that said, it's certainly not the case that even in the context of the emergence of that dissenting tradition, the government ceased to be an important interlocutor for faculty. So by the 1980s, Interactions between faculty and the National Research Council, the then bridge between the National Academies and US government policy, were gaining momentum. Mediated initially by Bob Cates and then subsequently by Roger Casperson, Billy Lee Turner, Susan Hansen, and others. And again, to make the point, those links happened precisely because of the disciplinary contributions and excellence coming from the departments in the areas of human environments, urban and feminist geographies. In that same period, when I was a student, so I'm old, when I was a student here in the 1980s, interac interactions with different parts of the US government and government policy were written all, really, all over the department. These are the ones that just came to mind as I was putting these notes together. Harry Schwartz's relationships with the Army Corps of Engineers related to water governance. Len Berry's interactions with US and African governments around resource management. Dwayne Noss's work on education and teaching with the and other with education institutions, that itself was a product of Saul Cohen's earlier large grants and policy work on teaching and education. Jerry Carrasco's, or it wasn't just Jerry Carrasco's, but Jerry Carrasco was the leader of the USAID cooperative agreement looking at regional development policy around the world. All the Three Mile Island work out of center, led by Roger Casperson and other GSG and non-GSG faculty. A little bit later, Sam Ratic bringing his links also to the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Hill. So, links to government were, excuse me, all over the department. But, but I think, this is another claim, I guess, I think from the 1990s, late 80s, 90s, new variants of that dissenting tradition took on progressively more strength also in the department, not replacing, but existing alongside. Um, the engagements with government. I think that, I would suggest, that partly reflected the arrival of new faculty, particularly Diane Rochelot, Jody Amel. Partly reflected the emergence of new social movements and the increased prominence of NGOs in society. I think it partly reflected, not sure what Ron and team think about this, the success of Idrisi and what turned out to be Idrisi's usefulness to many types of organizations who had varying issues, varying views of the, the socio-environmental governance issues that were, were, that were priorities and dealt with various publics. So it seems to me that faculty and students began to interact with an increasingly wide range of organizations with quite different ideas regarding the publics and the social change projects that they wanted to support with their work during that period and coming forward. And I think that's where the GSG is now. Plural interfaces with plural and diverse publics and through plural organizational forms and policy frames. But those interfaces and those engagements are real. A couple of final observations. I think it's also worth noting that running through that whole period, 
have been engagements with policy and institutional questions in Worcester. This was present in the 70s through more of a social justice lens, and over the last couple of decades has been deepened by HERO with its focus on, and I put this here in my notes, I'm sure the HERO people in the room may not see it this way, but with its focus on community development, environment, and land cover. And here I want to make a particular shout out to John Rogan and Deb Martin in recent years, who've shown the value of deep and sustained engagement with local government and local policy, uh, which has done an immense amount of good for Clark's place in the city. And in closing, and it will be a little bit, <laughs> just a little anecdote. As Jim said, I currently serve as the International Director of the Natural Resources and Climate Change Program at Ford. And not because I'm in that role, I promise, not because I'm in the role, but it turns out that three of our GSG alumni from the, from the 2010s, plus another three of my former doctoral students at Manchester, are actually grantees of that program. And they're leading on work to do with natural resource justice questions in Mexico, Peru, Ghana, Colombia, South Africa, Indonesia, and regionally in Latin America. I just want to end up saying it makes me really proud to see these alumni interactions with policy and socio-environmental governance and justice organizations around the world. It's not the first time, it won't be the last time, but I still think it's just really cool. Always wonderful to follow you. Thanks for that, Jim. <laughs> but thank you, Jim, for organizing this amazing, Herculean, magical, miraculous work. <laughs> and uh, thanks to all of you for, for being here today. Um, and thank you to my panelists for uh, actually you know, the opportunity for this conversation. Uh, so, so I think I'm here on this panel uh, particularly for my experience and engagement with two uh, of the kinds of institutions that we're discussing here. Uh, and those are uh, two global science policy institutions uh, doing work on global and global change at multiple scales. And uh, both of those institutions are actually connected to Future Earth, which is the umbrella initiative established in 2015, uh, designed to really promote work at the science policy interface the work of accumulated evidence, scientific scholarship uh, on global environment change research, essentially, over the three decades prior. So those two institutions are the Global Land Program, on the one hand, and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. By the mouthful, IPBES is the phonetic pronunciation that IPBES has decided it's going to use instead of IPBES or and so on. So um, I am going to start with, not that title slide, but the next slide, <laughs> um, which is essentially just a very brief and partial perspective history of some of these global scientific institutions on global environmental change, mainly to re really highlight um, the, oh great, I can actually use the pointer, mainly to highlight the entry of social science into the landscape. Right, of global environmental change, change research. Um, until that point, we had largely natural scientists engaging in environmental change research at multiple scales, all the way up to the global and down to the local. Um, but increasingly, there was a recognition within that community and without that community that um, no amount of additional modeling <coughs> and detailed empirical work um, was going to actually address, explain, successfully model or predict global environmental change. It did not really pay attention to human dimensions and indeed actually represent uh, the complexity of human interactions with the environment at scale, right? So, so that set the stage for the creation of the International Human Dimensions Program and the entry of social sciences into that space programmatically at the highest levels. Um, and um, just very briefly, uh, I mainly have engaged, oh, before that, <laughs> the Red Book. So many of us here are deeply familiar with the Earth Transform volume. We have uh, the, the editors represented in this room, of course. And this was no coincidence that you know, the, the NRC went on to publish the Rainbow Book in 1992, 
which was really not just documenting the uh, potential spaces for human dimensions research in global environmental change, but also actually uh, recommending some criteria for what that social science should and could look like. Um, right. So, so um, some of the really hybrid projects that resulted from that fertile time and fertile ground um, uh, was the Land Use and Climate Change Project, which continued for a number of years, concluded by 2005, and then uh, segued into the Global Land Program with, with whom I engaged for several years. Um, so again, uh, this, is the, this is the community that I've engaged with for the longest and also richly fertilized by conversations referred to in other panels this afternoon as well with cultural ecologists, political ecologists, vulnerability scientists, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to speak to the Global Land Program perspective, but before that, I'd like to briefly um, highlight the IPES perspective. Um, I was a coordinating lead author of the uh, inaugural global assessment of IPES, which was uh, approved in 2019. The summary for policymakers was released at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris in 2019, and essentially, unequivocally, IPES um, loudly centered on the need for transformative change, right? Deviating even much more strongly than IPCC in recent years, has taken a much more strong normative position in recent years, but it does uh, really went the extra mile and pointed out that economic optimism is really not you know, productive. It is in fact deeply endangering the life and health of the planetary systems and of indigenous peoples and local communities worldwide. So um, this work actually you know, highlights the centrality of land use and land cover change and sea use as the single largest driver of declines in biodiversity globally and ecosystem services well ahead of climate change in fact, but climate change was um, of course in second place and also actually highlighted the need for transformative governance, right? So there was a very strong, strong integration of multiple perspectives, including indigenous voices and indigenous knowledge systems in the production of the global assessment, um, which is even more deeply taken up in regional assessments and uh, uh, more, more sort of the values assessment, which was just released last year. So um, uh, I just want to make some comments to that. Um, one is the fact that the IPES values assessment uh, very strongly built on the regional uh, IPES assessments and lots of GSG alums have been extremely active in those regional assessments. Um, one example being Emma Archer, uh, actually I forget what year uh, she graduated, I believe it was 2000 if I'm not mistaken, um, from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, uh, who worked on climate and sustainable managed ecosystems, rangelands in Africa, and she was a co-chair of the best 2018 regional assessment for Africa and also active in the Global Environmental Outlook version 5, version 6, a coordinating lead author of the International Union of Forest Research Organizations Forests and Water Assessment, to Tony's point, there have been numerous engagements by numerous people from the GSG. Um, one additional really important comment that I want to make about IPES is about bridging the gap to the business and private sector. Uh, just a little bit over two weeks ago, three leading global experts were announced to be co-chairs for the brand new IPES Business and Biodiversity Assessment. This is a two-year methodological assessment that aims to categorize how businesses depend on and impact biodiversity and nature's contributions to people and identify criteria and indicators for measuring this. So Professor Jimena Rueda, Pajardo, Clark, 2007, is one of these co-chairs. Uh, along with Steve Pulaski and Matt Jones in the UK. Um, I don't think I have time to go into the particular uh, contributions that Jimena brings to this, but it is significant and multifaceted. Uh, so let me, in the interest of time, uh, move on to share just some perspectives from the Global Land Program um, on whose scientific steering committee I began to serve in 2014. I did that for about three, three and a half years, following which I co-chaired the Global Land Program for another three, three and a half years. Uh, we still have hooks in me, so I'm still continuing to work on the new science plan that the GLP steering committee is drafting, and so on and so forth. But the GLP, what's really interesting is the GLP begins in 2006 
under the aegis of Future Earth, the global institution that I mentioned, which is designed to promote greater integration across the science policy, policy interface, right? So it's not just national science, social science collaborations for a better global environment change research. It's specifically, you know, gearing up and, and with an eye towards transformative research, right? So, so in that light, GLP uh, has a very different kind of flavor from the preceding look, land use and climate change, right? So for one, its problem areas are really domains where you have really practical policy sorts of challenges and opportunities, right? I'm not going to read the slide out, go to the GLP website, we'll take a closer look at it. Um, but as a maturing science and a maturing discipline, maturing community, we engage in a lot of reflection, introspection, and uh, perspective sorts of planning exercises. And this involves certainly things like meta-analyses and syntheses and so on. But it also involves explicitly uh, embracing and taking uh, normative positions on the problems that we have long engaged in and studied, right? And that involves also writing articles uh, such as this one that was just published last year in PNAS uh, that, that sets out sort of 10 myths or really countering uh, 10 facts, or 10 facts countering 10 myths about land systems. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but let me just sort of suggest that one of them is the fact that we live on a used planet. There really is no free land, quote unquote, for, for example, nature preservation. Going to the active speaker scene, you know, for uh, sort of prohibition geographies, for prohibitionist conservation, if you will, right? Um, so uh, this is from uh, a GLP scientific steering committee fellow, Ruth DeFries, who many of us know, and you know, um, enjoy reading about her work and engaging with her. Uh, and this really goes to this again: the you know, what should be a model for protecting, for example, tropical forests, right? Uh, do we want to set aside land for nature conservation, right? Hafford, Neil Wilson, et cetera? Or do we want to promote a land sharing model for conservation, right? And, and uh, you know, those two paradigms broadly have been talked about as land sharing versus land sparing. I'm not trying to argue for one or the other, but to point out that these are really critical and critically different sorts of uh, epistemological and, and problem-oriented approaches to framing the debate and to engaging action around the debate. And uh, a lot of research, including some of my own research with um, uh, students and alums of Clark um, advisees, uh, points out, for example, in Yucatan, in the Yucatan, where I've worked for a long time, we seem to see a regime shift from a formerly land, sparing, land sharing model of conservation, where you have agriculture really imbricated with tropical forests and secondary forests and very dynamic mosaic, to much more of a land sparing model. Uh, you know, where you have intensification squeeze on one hand and conservation restrictions on the other, really splitting the landscape into partition spaces where you have one or the other objective. Uh, so these are challenging, these are challenging sort of moments, uh, but again, as maturing science, it sort of behooves us to really, you know, think about those spaces uh, uh, explicitly, normatively, the Global Land Program is now a member of the International Land Coalition, which also sort of is an example of that, the fact that we are taking positions, and we have always taken those positions, but we're doing it more <coughs> publicly now, and we are questioning um, uh, critically and reflexively the use of a lot of the tools that we ourselves also you know, um, have in our arsenal, including you know, spatial methodologies and so on, uh, and thinking about red plus projects and you know land zoning towards those projects and so on and so forth, but really um, I think um, you know gone are the days of sort of scientific neutrality if they ever existed, um, and we sort of need to uh, think about this need for transformative change. We need to do better, and I think we are trying to do better. Thank you. Okay, so I think I was invited on this panel to talk about the rebranding of geography and spatial sciences to the human environment and geographical sciences during my time at the National Science Foundation, which was a particular moment um, that was a bit sensitive. So, <clears throat> so to talk a bit, thank you. <laughs> to, so I wanna make a disclaimer first. There's many Clarkies have made institutional impacts. People here have already talked about that. I can only speak for myself. 
Uh, also, other people from Clark have been at NSF, someone like Eric, Eric Keyes. If I got to get into the archives, I could have studied this, but the archives. NSF building is still not really open. Um, as I'm no longer at NSF, I cannot speak for the agency. I could, so take anything I say really with a grain of salt. Uh, further, I'd say that Scott Freinchu and I were the program officers during the rebranding, but many, many hands touched the rebranding. Um, many previous program officers worked on it. It actually took a few years to do it, so it wasn't just magic. Um, lastly, I'm not arguing that me, an individual Clarky, sort of worked you know, at NSF and sort of changed, brought Clark to two heads. What I'm arguing is that the sort of unique uh, Clark perspective and the reputation of Clark and the work that people from the Clark program did actually made my job easy for the rebranding um, of HEGS. <clears throat> so I'm gonna um, start with a little bit, I always started uh, slides from NSF with this. The National Science Foundation was founded in 1950 and it's really founded uh, to, for competition with the space race. Uh, the social sciences didn't show up until the late 50s, and geography didn't show up until sometime in the 60s, just so you know. But it, it actually, by law, it's to promote the progress of science, which is the intellectual merit, and I, have, and I note science, not, it's not a research foundation, it's a science foundation. And the second piece was to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare to secure the national defense. That's the intellectual merit. So as the program officer makes a recommendation, and the recommendations go upward, these are the two cruxes of things I have to legally say. This is, this is contributing to generalized knowledge and theory building, and it's also contributing to society. So there were, obviously, geography is a little unique. Uh, and because it spans multiple paradigms, some of which don't really necessarily always have a place at the Science Foundation. Uh, geography was really well aligned with science at the time it got a seat at the table. Um, at NSF. So there's a diversity in what geography the discipline is and what act NSF actually funds legally by law. Uh, and I'd also note that there's an awful lot of disciplinary programs that were being deleted or um, changing into something else at NSF. M most directorates do, know, do not have um, programs anymore that are disciplinary specific. Social, behavioral, and economic sciences do, but several of those even disappear. And so there was a need to sort of rebrand. <clears throat> so there were some issues we were trying to address. Um, one of the ways we took this on was my goal was to not, um, my goal was to take the question out of where, do, where, does, where do, does a particular geographer belong? Not necessarily belonging in geography and spatial sciences or human environment <coughs> and geographic sciences. My goal was to get geographers to the right location. And the reality, and to understand the institutional architecture um, of the National Science Foundation. Geographers, in truth, are funded in every single directorate across the agency. They, at the, if you go into the archives at NSF, there was some discussion early on that geography should maybe be in geo. And so, you know, there's this uneasy place of where geography belongs, but if you think of the institutional architecture of NSF, geography is in um, social, behavioral, and economic sciences, and that means as funding recommendations go upward, you have to justify why it's being funded, and that's a very human-centered space. And so that's really important. Another thing that uh, the rebranding served was to remind folks that the National Science Foundation is indeed a science foundation, and that's, it has specific obligations by law. And the third one, and the, the, the sort of reason there was an internal branding as well, the kind of bringing back human environment into the name, was to create opportunities for geographers for convergence in cross-directed activities that were happening at NSF to create space at the table. There was an awful lot of money in things like navigating the New Arctic, sustainable regional systems, coastlines and people, um, dynamics of uh, integrated socio-ecological systems, signals in the soil. We wanted to claim, hey, geographers do this. And a lot of people at the foundation still didn't understand that. So there was internal and external branding. So the Clark influence here. So for me, this was easy to convince my colleagues that geography is the original study of the human environment. And, and people, people bought that, so I was, I was thrilled. And that helped us <laughs> with our place. And, and honestly, when we looked at what, pe what we were funding in uh, GSS, turned heads, we were mostly funding human environment research. 
The geographical sciences was a big box to catch everything else. We didn't want to just make it geospatial. We wanted a space for cultural geography and economic geography and all the other types of geographies which we valued. But we wanted to also, you know, this sent a message that what we fund is at this nexus. So in, in, in kind of thinking about um, how Clark sort of impacted thinking about the solicitation, uh, one is geography is the bridge. And I'm going to pick on a few people, but not that many, because I started with a long list, and there's so many people that influenced us. But this is the Sky Dance Bridge in Oklahoma City. Uh, and I love this bridge. It's the state bird, which is the surtail, which is an important bird species for the Choctaw Nation. Uh, it's known for eating really harmful insects, and it's a spirit bird, and also is a, a, is a, it's a symbol of a, of a robust environment. Uh, dancing here is Denny Medicine Bird, who is adapted the uh, Native American Southern straight dance style to Demi Lovato's cover of the R&B classic, Lovely Day. Uh, dancing across this bridge, this was live cast uh, for Joe Biden's inauguration. So there's some magic that happens when you bridge multiple worlds. Uh, and I see geography as a bridge, and I think this is, this is where I'm going to call on Billy Turner, because he always pushed us to speak to science, right? Geography is stronger when it speaks to science. He wrote a lot about this, um, and that was something that I took. So geography aligning itself with science. <clears throat> The other um, thing that I think is in the solicitation or make, tries to make space for is a sort of Diane Rochelow and a lot of other people from Clark, but geography is bricolage, right? All of these rich, wonderful things that people talk about being able to have the freedom to uh, bring into geography from elsewhere. So there's a lot of people that uh, influenced this. And I also think I, I, I gave you my slides and then I thought, oh, I left out a slide. But the other one that I would have would be geography as care or geography as engagement. And I think that's really a Cates and Casperson, this sort of idea of geography for good. Um, and that's the addition of bringing in participatory, community-engaged citizen science approaches to the foundation, which was another part of sort of my platform I developed for my time at the agency. So this, I think, is a critical sentence um, that is quintessentially, in my mind, Clark. But I see Clark embedded in this solicitation or having influenced it and the, the research that everybody does um, that has spread out through so many places. But geography as the human environment, historically. Geography as bridge and bricolage and geography as care and engagement. Uh, and geography as doing or speaking to science will also diverse and sometimes critical perspectives. And my last thought here. So for me, it's clear that Clark Geography has had large and substantial institutional impacts on science and research. My hope for Clarkies is to uh, keep that future going and bright and embrace that diversity uh, and that human environment tradition to, but while continuing to speak to science but also creatively growing and bridging. Uh, and practicing care. Um, that is all that I have to say. Thank you. Remember, it's the down button. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to the beginning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Off to the races. I am pleased and humbled to be included in this panel. I've always been curious about the world, always wanting to learn, and Clark is really a rich place for inquiry. I've been inspired by hearing a lot of the talks today and yesterday, and seeing a lot of the people that have been so influential to me over the years, and it's really nice to reconnect. So, um, so here we are, all together like we were, right, when we were all in school here, thinking about things that we share deep interest in, in geography. Um, and what I'm going to do today is a little different than my colleagues on this panel have done. I'm going to briefly share two stories with you, stories that illustrate some of the many ways that Clark Geography has led the way into novel findings and improved understanding of the world, specifically for entrepreneurial and tech domains. So this is a little bit different. 
I love sharing these because they're so surprising and it's so exciting when you run home and you tell your family the things that you've discovered that day or the things that have really broken something new open for you. And so these are the things uh, I had a hard time picking from the different things that we've worked on over the years, but there's two here that I'd like to do. These are quick intros. They're not full explanations <coughs> because time doesn't allow. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a taste. So I'm going to stand up and just a little more fun. <laughs> All right, here we go. So in 1970, the median home value in Bridgeport, Connecticut was higher than in Nantucket. Uh, but by the 80s, Nantucket real estate was some of the most expensive in America. And so, you know, why was this? And where's the next Nantucket? And I'm like, this was really inspiring question. It's really what it was. It wasn't, we, we didn't answer it. But we got somewhere with it. And we were inspired by that kind of question, you know? So we noodled this and worked on this for 10 years as part of these projects that we work on in this, in this company. And I want to show you what some of this looks like. Two zip codes in San Francisco. These are out of sample. Um, ways of taking a look at this to make sure that we got them correct for two different zip codes that had very different trajectories and we used hind casting to see how well they did. The orange is the home price index reported by a third party for those zip codes over those time periods and the blue is our prediction from our three-year model. And you can see how one of them on the left went up to some degree, crashed, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, but then it came back pretty quick and strong, the one on the left. The one on the right went up really fast, and then it crashed really hard in real estate values and stayed down for a long time. And then it slowly came back. In fact, by the end of this, 2017, it still wasn't as high as it was in 2006. So it really crashed. The models were good at predicting both scenarios, even at the zip code level. So we built this into a product that you could take a look at things at the census tract and even block group level for three and five years out. No, not 10 or 20, but three and five, right? So let me show you what it looks like around here. I did a quick search 20 miles around Worcester <laughs> and I picked, I want to see the highest values at the census tract level, three-year forecast. The darker colors are a better match to the highest predicted forecast in 36 months. The number one pick was the town center of Northboro. That is a change as a percentage of its value today to what it would be three years from now. And there's a really interesting pattern to this. This was taking pure Clark approach, pure geographic approach to something that has normally been in the domain of economists. We looked at different spatial scales. We nested the models from national to metropolitan to local. That's one story. Here's the second story. This is a storm cloud. This is hail. $6.2 billion a year is a low ball measure of the impact of the hail <coughs> damage on houses. This doesn't include the damage on cars. It doesn't include the damage to crops. Some of those estimates are closer to $20 billion per year, and it's growing. Atmospheric turbulence is expanding further, and the footprint of suburbia is spreading into the target zone where these things are likely to happen. But there's a big problem. Where hail falls and where hail claims are most likely are two different things. And most existing products are really focused on weather event data. They <coughs> focus on quantifying the hazard. Where is it? How can we get better at that? We started thinking very broadly about this. We started looking at the social amplification of risk and how we could bring that to bear on this problem. It is a huge problem. 
We independently generated, collected, developed, and maintained information to better understand the pathways to these claims. We analyzed this information. We identified these factors, among others, that helped us predict it. Hail event frequency and hail size probability, climate and physiography, property building qualities, conditions, and repair costs, and what we call claiming pattern science to the lay audience, which essentially is the social amplification of risk. It turns out, in a strange world, upside down world, that it's a combination of the hazard, the vulnerability of the property, and the foraging patterns of roofing contractors after the hail events. And it's a foraging pattern that is surprisingly consistent and that we can predict. Knock, knock, knock. I'm here to give you a free estimate for fixing your roof. And the power that this has in predicting. Why is this important? Those insurance companies go out of business, they leave your area, people are left. Nothing to have. So watch. These dots are policies, homeowner policies around Denver. The red dots are where there were hail claims, and the slate blue dots are where there were policies that didn't have hail claims. From 2014 through 2018, it was $202 million in premium, $153 million of losses, 11,000 claims, 81,000 policies. Now, hail storm science is this for that same exact area where they have CL is core logic. Shout out to Wei Du. Is he here? Core logic. Uh, hail storm risk. Red is higher risk. But this is what it looks like when we were looking at the risk of claims, when you take in the social amplification, the vulnerability, as well as the hazard. Well, when you put those, lay those over, what does it look like in segmentation? On the left is the predictive ability of the hail storm data, going from hail claims per thousand earned exposures, which is one policy one year, up to the top, and it's not that good. And here is what we were able to get over here using this approach, the Clark approach, right? Taking a look at this in a whole different way. And here's how important this is within a single zip code. <coughs> the differences in one zip code in Colorado can go from, in one case, an average annual projected hail loss of $92 to one of over $1,100 per year. It's a massive difference. So Clark uniquely helps bring lots of things to, to these big challenges. And there is so much white space, so much opportunity to, to look at more. It's domain knowledge, theory, understanding of the problems. It's mixed some with technical skills to be able to explore and play with that. And very importantly, it's the ability to think very broadly and to navigate paradoxes. I ran into a lot of resistance by bringing this to the people who storm chase in Oklahoma. They said, you can't do better than we do. You know what I mean? And so this, being able to navigate those paradoxes. And so I think there's an opportunity for Clark to even be more impactful through the marriage of Clark geography and entrepreneurship very broadly in a large area. So that's my story. Have, oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, okay, we still have about uh, 25 minutes. Um, so I'm opening the floor. I've, I'm fairly fleet of foot, so let me know if I can run to you. In the meantime, while you're thinking of questions for our panels, the comment about the contract that we had in the department of USAID was I was looking to the meeting minutes of going back in the files, the archives, and, and the grant reports. I'm sure Billy remembers, Susan remembers these as well. And there would be Carrasca, and it would be, it would just say Bolivia, $30,000. Then it would say Colombia, $30,000. Yeah. 
Sierra Leone, like it was literally just a list of countries with piles of money next to them that were coming through through that USAID funding, which is quite remarkable, and I, I long for those days <laughs> to come back. But anyone have any questions? Comments? Wonderful. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Dale Cohen, and I'm a plus one to a geography graduate here. Um, I did not come here. But uh, my question is, what is Clark doing now to tap into the vein of entrepreneurship and its incredible resources? Sad Clark anymore, but it's on. Yeah. Oh, sure. But but so I mean, convergence is everywhere across every foundation, every agency, uh, federal agency. Convergence is the future. Um, there was a huge kind of leak about a potential sort of totally revamping NSF to make it also a technology hub, and it would infuse uh, the National Science Foundation with things several billion dollars. But it would definitely change. Um, the way we do research. And I think convergence is about bringing more people to the table. Part of that is the citizen science community engagement, et cetera. But there's things like the you know incubators for business. Signals in the soil is a perfect one. This idea that we can make these small um, you know, microcomputers or things that look for signals in the soil that could give farmers and ranchers information in real time, et cetera, and that businesses uh, and scientists need to work together. And I think that's a big future of how uh, research is going to get done. So NSF is moving, I think, in my mind, a bit more to something that looks kind of applied, but is in relationship with um, industry. I'm not sure. <laughs> what they're doing directly. But I know that Clark generally has embraced entrepreneurship in a variety of dimensions. I do think it's pregnant with opportunities for all kinds of things to happen here at uh, Clark Geography. I know that there's multiple people who have gone into the private sector to do things. Some have been uh, working for companies. Some have been more entrepreneurial than others. Um, I think problem solving in those dimensions where that Clark perspective really brings something that they don't have. They truly don't. I've found lots of people in geography at fairly high level and a lot of, of large companies on the science side, but they are more, more focused on the technical than they are looking at these broader holistic kinds of issues, uh, and they're missing a lot of that opportunity. That's why my comment about white space. I think there's white space for us to do more from Clark Geography. Um, uh, I think there's white space maybe for Clark Geography to, to engage more as well. But I think it's probably the private sector needs to reach out more to Clark Geography. I think that's it. So, great question. And I don't really have a direct answer to the specifically the entrepreneurship part of it. But I will say that uh, institutionally, uh, there are some really interesting new avenues at Clark uh, uh, that really encourage um, and create the space for and allow uh, community collaborations, right? So uh, academic community collaborations, uh, some of which can really lead to fostering entrepreneurship potentially. So um, I've been very fortunate uh, to be able to teach uh, some courses that are labeled as problems of practice courses. Uh, sometimes these courses come with a little bit of an extra bump in terms of uh, funding available to foster different kinds of things. Um, uh, I've been able to leverage that with serving on the board of Mass Audubon here, uh, working particularly in New England's largest urban wildlife sanctuary, uh, collaborating with them on trying to think about uh, more equitable ways of doing urban stream restoration. And um, one of the courses I inherited from Diane Rochelo, I don't know if Diane's in the room, I teach urban ecology here, and, um, and I layered that with another seminar that I taught last fall for the first time on environmental stewardship 
and was able to actually work with an amazing group of students, some of whom are in the room right now, to actually do some creative, you know, really, um, I hate to use the term service learning, I just don't like that term very much, but, but really collaborative, co-produced kinds of research and, uh, and products, including Esri story maps to tell stories, uh, you know, and also in, in, invite public engagement, present some of those results, not just at the, and, you know, the American, uh, 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 you know, the AAG meetings, but uh, also at the Mass Land Conference, which is a conference of local land trusts uh, here in Massachusetts annually. So there's some really interesting things happening, uh, which is exciting, you know, so, so I don't have to feel like I'm just stuck in a classroom teaching. There's a lot of space for those kinds of rich collaborative um, work. Nothing much to add, but Rinku's comments are helpful, I think, in thinking that maybe a way to pass your question is to, is to think this differently about between social, social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship that is in one way or another commercially oriented. And I think my, my self-critical answer would be that historically and still, it's a community that is much better at fostering and social entrepreneurship and building links with social entrepreneurs. These are just some sort of examples. It has been, we, this should be, have been much more diffident about market-oriented entrepreneurship. And I think that's what's so valuable about having Andrew's presentation in this session, because it's it should be a challenge to us, which isn't, isn't the same as saying go out and engage with all sorts of companies. But it is about thinking in a, again, a more past way about different routes to progressive social change. And some of those routes pass through the economy. And that has not been our strong point, I think. So both a comment and a question. Uh, I mean, Tony, you talked about how in different decades uh, the department has engaged differently with the, with the community, government institutions and everything. Um, so this decade we are seeing more engagement, more involvement from the commercial sector in the climate tech, as they call it, right? Climate is our basically urgent social issue and commercial is investing in that. How do you think Clark Geography should play a role in that, in terms of engaging with the climate tech sector, play a more significant role in that? Not just that that is the only venue, but how it should expand in those regions, because as a new faculty, I don't see much of that happening now. Should we go in that direction or not? How do you feel, or, and others, if you want to comment on that? So, I mean, I'm disinclined to, to take a should position. Um, it's easier to be self-critical than to say what your colleagues and yourself should do. Um, but I think your arrival here is not insignificant in thinking about the answer to that question. And it comes from a different sort of background from classic GSG faculty. And that can only be good for the sorts of conversations that will drive internally about the, those sorts of engagements. Um, if I was to say anything in the should register, I would say two things. Not by running away from it and burying our heads in the sand. Should not do that. And like, so not just dismissing it. Um, the other should should be, but reflexively and self-critically. And that kind of comes back to my comments about what I think is important for the strength of community, which is to accept that there are different ways of engaging and accept that different people in your community think that there are different ways of engaging and to not try and insist that one is better than the other. So another part of this should, should be to collectively accept that there will be different views and to feel comfortable living with those different views and those different responses. Otherwise, it will harm the community. I'll, let, I'll let, rather have others talk, but I want to make a comment, but maybe later. Okay. 
David Angel. I wanted to go back to the entrepreneurship question, if I could, and kind of um, put a thesis out there. I think probably the biggest push that Clark has tried to make in the last 10, 15, 20 years that opens up the possibility for a connection between entrepreneurship and scholarship here is um, embracing alumni. I think you know institutions like Clark have tens of thousands of alumni working in every uh, field in, uh, imaginable. Now you could you could ask every one of the alumni who are in this room today, and they would find a place to connect the ideas that you have um, been discussing uh, throughout this panel. And I, you know, the building across the street is called the Alumni and Student Engagement Centre, and it was very intentionally um, opened as a place that would. Um, invite and welcome alumni engagement with the scholarship of the university. And I think that's probably the best bet that Clark has to, 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 to fulfill what you call for, uh, Andrew, in terms of broadening the uh, impact of, of the school at that time. Uh, uh, just a thought. Anyone? Gustavo Oliveira, a new faculty at the GSG. This panel is focused on policy and institutions rather than contributions to the discipline and geography. And I think that many other panels will be talking about more of the contributions to the discipline. But I would like to hear any of you on the panel to comment on is the way in which we train, especially our graduate students. When I think of contributions to the discipline, part of that is training graduate students that will go on to tenure track positions in other universities including others that issue their own PhDs in geography, and that seems to be one of the main ways in which you know, a Clark geography, a Clark diaspora, and the contributions gets made. But on the other hand, many of our uh, students also graduate and go into the uh, private sector, into government, uh, and you know, all sorts of research institutions and so forth and so on here and around the world. My question is, how do you think that we can envision these dynamics? You know, the job market is increasingly tough. We do want to train uh, PhD students that will be the next generation of faculty at PhD granting institutions. But at the same time, uh, I don't want them to have a sense that, uh, oh, if I can't make it in the academic job market, then I'm just relegated to the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> you know, so given that this is a panel which we get to talk about uh, contributions to, to policy and ways in which you know Clark e geographers do go into private sector and government and so forth and so on. You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on these dynamics. You know, there's there's tensions, uh, there's questions, there's ambiguities, there's potential. There's so much that I'd love to hear you all comment on uh, as far as placement of our students. All right, who wants to go first? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I thought your question was going to go in a different direction, but you changed directions on me, Gustavo, midway, but uh, I, I'm going to go for it. So, so I think um, we don't do a very good job of training uh, uh, our graduate students for jobs outside of academia. I, what I mean to say is we should do a better job than we are doing. I don't think we're failing entirely. We have lots and lots of wonderful illustrious alumni that are definitely in the government sector or private sector that are flourishing. Um, uh, but I think that we should be doing more. And, um, and I, think, I think one of the things that does port from the training that we give our students for academia versus training that they would need for the private sector or for government is interdisciplinarity, respectful collaboration, team-based work. Right? And I think that in principle, and most often times in reality, you know, that, is, that is something we find in the halls here at Clark GSG. Uh, but I think there is, there's room for improvement, right? And those things also, you know, they, they, they oscillate, they don't, they're not a flat line, uh, and they're not an ascending line either. And I think uh, uh, we can and should better do better on that. Like now, there was an article published in Science almost two decades ago about um, the most <clears throat> excuse me, high impact work 
um, that was coming out, that was compiled over, I think, three or four decades, um, was coming out of collaborative teams. And this finding was not true just of the natural sciences, it was also true of the social sciences and humanities and patents. So those are the four sectors of data analysis that went into this science article, right? And I, I don't think there's been a repeat updated version of that in science, but I will bet my life that that has not changed, right? So, so I think that we need to continue to break down those silos um, I think there's broadly speaking at the community level, there's collaboration and exchange of this and that, but I think we need to actually reward that and encourage that and, um, and um, uh, privilege that a lot more than, than, than we maybe are. But that's, not, that's kind of a vague answer to, uh, I think, your question, but uh, I open up to my fellow panelists to be better answers for us. Great question. You know what, I've got a thought. <coughs> I, I think there's way more opportunity for Clark Geography to influence things in entrepreneurship, which I mentioned. But you can't do everything. And Clark is super strong at placing people in PhD granting programs. It, I don't think it would be a great idea to, to do the other and leave that. You know what I mean? I, I just, I just think that there's a lot of white space and a lot of opportunity to be able to make an impact on things that are significant, um, maybe by leveraging it in some other way. I'm not sure how to, but I think that Clark is so, is so rich with, with uh, the ability to place people in fantastic academic positions and to really in, influence that way that um, perhaps that is a big influence. Perhaps that influence is down the chain. But um, it's very impressive. I think the only, and I'm not sure if this is what, one of the things you were talking around, Gustavo. Part of the response is things that the department can do, and part of the response is ways that the department can be. So the, there's a, we've talked about a number of do things, certain ways of training, and so But as you were asking the question, I was also thinking it has implications for ways of being inside the department as well, which hinge around <coughs> what gets valued and what doesn't get valued, and how that's communicated internally that hinge around, this was a slightly apparent last night, there, is a certain, there can be moments of a certain language of the pure and the impure, and that doesn't help value what gets cast as the impure. And so thinking about how we value diversity in forms of engagement and communicating that internally is important for addressing the, the part of your question where you talked about well, people who might think that they're going to the second best jobs because they couldn't get into the, these jobs that are most highly valued inside the way the department talks about what's valued. So I think there is something about how notions of value are talked about inside the department that's a response to your question as well, beyond specific forms of training and professional orientation. Great, um, just one thing I wanted to add while I'm going over to Laura here. One of the things that I discovered, which I should have known about, but when I got into all the archives and I looked at the history of GSG was, we were, for 60 or 70 years, the leader in geographic education in this country. I mean, Wallace Atwood writes the textbooks. when he's, he's writing all the textbooks, and then we had Henry Warman. And I think when we think about the ways in which the challenges of interconnecting with entrepreneurs and things, a lot of that has to do with just geographical literacy. What do geographers do? How do geographers go about what they do? How, you know, Andrew obviously knows, he's a PhD in geography, but a lot of the people you interact with don't know, in part because we, you know, we've kind of devalued that educational dimension of what our, our role is. And I think that in terms of impact, I feel like I have the most impact in the real way in the classroom in the interactions with my PhD students as well, just to be perfectly honest. But, um, but you know, I think that's an interesting question to think about, and, and it goes back to Tony's point about valuing different forms of engagement. You know, not just have to be just 
um, high-end, you know, science publications, you know? So uh, my name is Laura Souls. I finished my PhD in 2019 and half my committee is sitting up there. Um, and my, I actually was going to echo something Tony just said in response to that question about um, how to prepare PhD students for other types of career paths. And I think it's something actually, Tony, I want to give you a lot of props for and for as well. I came in saying I don't want to be an academic and I was still somehow accepted to this program. And I also, over the course of my five years here, decided actually academic, academic work sounds like a pretty good life for me. And I came from government, right? I already had that experience working in this public sector. Um, but I think the fact that my committee was willing to take me on, even if I wasn't going to be bringing forward their legacy in the academic sphere, and knowing that I had choices, and that those were all okay, was actually incredibly empowering and powerful. Um, and I think about our, our lab coffee, our lab group in, of Tony's, um, where of that group of, I think when I started, there were maybe eight or nine of us in the room, probably half of us are in academic type jobs and the other half are doing amazing work for, you know, have worked for Oxfam and Stockholm Environment Institute and are in a way taking forward that, uh, the legacy of what they've learned at Clark and making the, the changes in terms of how they're funding grassroots groups or how they are intervening in policy spaces. So I think that was actually, that acceptance and that support was really powerful um, because as Rinku pointed out, the skills themselves are, are often very much transferable. Um, so I wanted to comment directly on that because I think you are modeling that and I think the more that that becomes part of the practice of accepting the variety of pathways, the more powerful um, that legacy will actually be. And I did actually have a question, but we're probably out of time. So, a quick one. really quick? I don't know if it's a quick one. Um, I was thinking back on this uh, history of kind of engagement with the public sector and the state and more conventional places of power and this history of dissent, and it feels like there might be um, a back and forth tension that maybe still exists today within the department between uh, reform and transformation or, or forms of resistance. And I, um, this is not to get to pure, any kind of pure idea of either of those, but I wonder if um, how we hold that, those tensions between who to engage with and how, uh, when there are kind of differences of, um, I'll say differences of opinion, but it's of course much deeper than that, about how we affect change in the world given that history of commitment to things like social justice. Yes, no, maybe. Uh, who, wants to go? <laughs> who wants to go quick? Anyone want to jump in for the, we've got, 60, well, we also have cocktail hour now, so we can, we can continue that there. That might be preferred by many people. Um, anybody want to try that? Okay, nope. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a pretty, it's a very good question, and I have a lot of opinions about it as well. Uh, or maybe they're just epistemologies, um, you know, who knows. But um, I wanted to sincerely thank our panelists and the audience for being here. Great, great session, really appreciate it, and it's just really enlightening, so thank you so much. And, and just so you know, we're, we're convening at 5.30 over at Tilton again in the Wetzel Terrace for a much needed beer or a glass of wine or soft drink. <laughs>